Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Science Friday live stream. I'm so excited that you are here. I'm Diana, the Experiences Manager for Science Friday and the manager of our book club. And I'm joining you from kind of cloudy Brooklyn, New York today. Thank you so much for joining us, no matter where you are joining from. Speaking of which, we have people in the chat already letting us know where they are from. If you are signed into a YouTube account, you can join us in the chat at any time. It just really takes a having a Google account. So you can go ahead and join and let us know where you are from. We have a lot of people joining from Oklahoma, San Jose, Philadelphia, Indiana, Oregon, Ohio, another Oregon, Rochester, Maryland, Chicago, Kentucky. Oof, so many people. I'm so excited that you are all here. Um, if you don't know Science Friday, we are your one-stop shop for all things science news. We're well known for our weekly radio show, which airs every, you guessed it, Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. You can listen to us live on your local radio station or by visiting sciencefriday.com, where you can click the banner at the top and um, listen live. But today, we're doing something slightly different. We are talking about this month's book club pick. We read Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers by Mary Roach, which tells the story of some important cases cadavers have helped crack and how their contributions in depth, depth have helped us live better. And if you want to join fellow readers to discuss that book and all the other books that we read, we read a new book every month. You can join us on our community space, which is hosted on Mighty Networks. And I will put a link to the chat a little bit later in the day so you can join us there. A kind reminder to everyone before we get started, Science Friday is committed to providing a welcoming and harassment-free environment for members of all ethnicities, ages, gender and trans statuses, sexual orientations, physical abilities, national origin, beliefs, and any other dimension of diversity. We've created a code of conduct, which you can read in its entirety on our community space to help us create a safe and positive community experience for all. And we believe that providing clear expectations is a necessary part of building a respectful community. Here are the basics. Be supportive and respectful when speaking with one another and asking questions in the chat. Share generously and listen closely. You can add thoughts whenever in the chat, even if they aren't strictly questions for our guests, they can be reactions, they can be thoughts and feelings. What comes to mind, keep in mind, share generously and listen closely. Stay on topic as much as we're, we can. We're here to discuss uh, this month's book club pick, which again is Stiff by Mary Roach and closely related topics. So we might go on little bits of tangents, but we'll try our best to stay on topic. And we've reserved the right to ban anyone who engages in demeaning, discriminatory and harassing behavior in the chat today. All right, thank you for sticking with me. It is time to welcome onto the stage our author for today's live stream. So. Please join me in the chat by clapping and doing whatever emoji makes you happy for our guest, Mary Roach. She is the author of Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, which again is sci-fi book club pick for this month, and several other books, including Gulp, Packing for Mars, Spook, and most recently, Fuzz, When Nature Breaks the Law. She lives in Oakland, California. Mary, welcome to live stream. Thank you so much, Diana. I'm very excited to be here. I'm very honored to be a sci-fi book club pick. It, it is a great book. And thank you so much for taking time to chat with our community here today. A quick reminder to our audience, we want your questions. So put them in the chat whenever makes sense. We are going to get to as many audience questions as we possibly can. Um, and we will start just, I, I would love to just hear from you about how you pitch this book to people. If you have 30 seconds to pitch someone on what is stiff, what do you tell them? <laughs> it's always been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, stiff is a, it's a, a book about um, unusual and useful contributions of the dead. Uh, I mean, it's cadaver research basically, um, but I, I, I like to describe it as um, unusual post-mortem careers because people end up, people who donate themselves to science uh, uh, end up doing some fairly interesting, sometimes strange, and um, almost always really uh, helpful and beneficial things. So it's a, a look at some of the lesser known uh, things that are the research avenues and, and ways that the dead have contributed as dead people. Yeah, it is just, um an amazing book. And uh, I said this to our community space that 
this, this book came out 20 years ago and it still reads fairly contemporary. Um, when you went back and sort of read certain passages for to, in order to add to the new epilogue that was in the most recent um, edition, were you sort of like struck by anything that was in the book or were you just excited to like sort of see some of the writing that, I mean, this was, this was your first, it wasn't your first publication. You had published articles before, but this was your first book. It was my first book. Um, that's right. Um, you know, going back, I didn't, uh, you know, I knew we wanted to do an epilogue to kind of bring things, freshen it up and, and cover some things that may have uh, developed in the intervening 20 years. Um, but one thing that surprised me was, was, I mean, it shouldn't have surprised me. You know, people still die and there's still the same basic kinds of things that, that they're needed for base, you know, the things that you certainly wouldn't want to do to a live person. And mm -hmm. that's not going to change, but it, um, it, and I didn't go back and read it line by line. I, I find that uh, too too painful. I think you know I would have been like, oh, should I change this? Should I change that? That seems kind of immature. That uh, uh. you know, it's very it's a it's a product of its time, and I so I addressed some of the language changes and stuff in the epilogue. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, so when I would dip back in, it was a mix of like, oh, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said it that way, and then also, oh, this th this book's kind of good, <laughs> you know, like. Like I, it's just because it's so long ago, I kind of had this sense that it would feel very uh, dated to me. And in some ways it does, but um, it was it was it was fun to to do the epilogue and to get to talk to some of the folks who uh, I I interacted with the 20 years ago and some. Yeah. New folks. yeah, of course. Did you do you have like a, a area of research? So the book covers so many different ways that cadavers contribute to science. There's research um, about like car crashes, there's anatomy, the classic sort of anatomy class for uh, medical students, but there were so many different sort of topics. Were you, as you were doing research for this book, so, like utterly surprised by some of the ways that we have used cadavers in research in the past or even in the present? There were a few that stood out to me as kind of surprising and even um, shocking. I, I think I would nominate uh, the work that was done by Pierre Barbet in the, I guess it was the early 1900s. Uh, he was trying to uh, validate, I guess you could say, the, the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. So he um, literally took cadavers and I, who knows, maybe these were people who wanted this to be done with their bodies. I doubt it. But anyway, he, he had, you know, sort of uh, uh, he took some whole bodies and had them on a cross and others, you know, it was just like it was a, a hand with a nail. I was like, <laughs> really? <laughs> and then, like, yeah. how, did, how did this happen? Like, how how were you able to do that? That I mean, that was certainly unexpected. And some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the medicinal uses of dead bodies historically, you know, um, like as, as met, you know, as can as medicine, um, that, that was, uh, certainly something I wasn't familiar with the, um, sort of, um, putting them in a tomb with honey and waiting a hundred years and then going here, this will cure, this will cure you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that was certainly unexpected. Um, so yeah, a few, a few of them were, well beyond anything I could have imagined. Yeah, e even with all of the sort of outliers, the the sort of like on the far end, you you say in the book, you know, 70, 80 percent of people who donate their bodies to science, the sort of general science, their yeah. their bodies are used as part of anatomy classes, and um, and so there's a, there's a large percentage of people who you know who kind of have a probably have a very clear understanding of how um, their body will be used when they're when it's donated, um, and it and your book sort of explores all these other possibilities, which I think was yeah. really cool. Um, would it be accurate to say that you wrote this book partially to convince people to consider this as an option, sort of after they've passed? It would be accurate to say that. If someone reads the book uh, and makes that decision, I'd really like to, to, to do something useful and helpful with my remains. That's the best possible outcome for me. Mm -hmm. But it mm -hmm. wouldn't be accurate to say that that was <laughs> my motivation. My motivation was, I'd like to write a book. I've been doing shorter pieces. It feels like everything's been written about. 
Um, and what what has what not been written? <laughs> mm -hmm. Look, nobody's nobody's done this one. I'll do I'll do the cadaver one. <laughs> so it was it was and it was um, it was also partly came about through a conversation with uh, a, uh, an agent who's still my agent because uh, saying, you know, you should maybe explore. This was a topic I'd written about in a column on salon.com. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's like, why don't you see what had the highest hit rates? Why don't you explore this? And I'm like, this is a terrible book idea. This is <laughs> no one who would buy this book or read this book or like this book. So uh, it, it, yeah, it was, I didn't, I didn't have a mission to um, increase the ranks of uh, body donation, willed body donation. It was more just um, maybe people would find this interesting. Uh, it turns out um, many people did. <laughs> and your book, you know, having a sort of a second printing of the book too is just like you. I, I love the sort of array of different covers that come with this new, you know, paperback printing. Um, one of our uh, community members actually wondered about that specifically do you how much of a say do you have as an author in the um covers of the book and also do you have like sort of a soft spot in your heart for the original cover it's sort of a um image of a, a foot with a with a tag on it that has the the name of the book on it so a little different than the the cover yeah. which you can see sort of in the in the bottom corner yeah there. yeah yeah um actually the to, the the foot with the toe tag believe it or not which i now see as a great cover at the time, I, I fought against that because I, I mean, I, never, never ask an author <laughs> what they <laughs> think you should do with the cover. Because I was like, first of all, toe tags, you don't have a toe tag on a, um, a, a research cadaver. That's sort of like a, <clears throat> a more, you know, somebody's in the morgue and uh, like the, the, um, a forensics criminal justice system trope. And I felt like, you know, it doesn't really fit the, and also, the, the um, the image felt to me because it was around the time the Six Feet Under came uh, onto mm. into popularity, and it felt a little reminiscent of that. And so I was like, oh, I don't think you should do this. And fortunately, my publisher is like, Well, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are certain people who have certain jobs, and you you have to listen yeah. to the people who say they've got no, a good no, idea. Exactly. Um, and there was an earlier we it's a kind of a long story but there was a very weird first i don't even have a copy of it the advanced readers edition had this weird it was like a naked dead guy apparently dead like face down typing and then the page coming out of the typewriter said stiff by mary roach which made it seem like i was the dead bald naked guy typing and interesting um and fortunately somebody from oh there my light just went out uh someone someone from uh Borders was like, we'd like to f feature this book in original voices, but this cover is terrible. So then they did the feet and, mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, it, it's a good, I like that cover, but I'm very, I like that. My favorite is the new one, the, the one that's here on the screen. That yeah. It's a, it's a great cover and it's so, it's nice seeing all of the paperback sort of lined up matching. Yeah. The whole, sure the, whole enjoy back, that. the whole backlist is the same designer and it's, yeah, I, it, it's, it's been really exciting to have that. Yeah. A lot of our readers mention the sort of like levity and sort of irreverence and humor that you use as part of this book, but also that that you know carries through in your writing style throughout your other books. How do you walk that line between humor and like a head-on approach that some people, you know, I I think I wouldn't say disregard, but I think that you you know blunt, some people blunt blunt yeah yeah how, how do you sort of walk that line and and yeah. make people sort of see the humor and some of the light levity in some of these really heavy topics? yeah um that's something I actually struggle with a lot um like where do you draw that line and um I don't know that I always draw it in the right place I mean when stiff when I first turned in stiff um it didn't have the uh the forensics of airplane crashes. It didn't have that chapter because even though it was in the book proposal, mm. uh, I didn't do it because I just didn't feel like there could be a way that wouldn't be disturbing to say, I mean, it was because it's, it's focused on, I think it's TWA flight 800 and some of the oh. families are still, yeah. you know, they're, they're still around and how I, I was thinking about them and if they read this and so we didn't even write it. And then my editor, shrewdly enough goes hey i noticed <laughs> this that the plane crash chapter isn't here and i explained it to her and she said you know what i think you should give it a try 
So that chapter isn't, it's not funny. There's not a lot of humor in that chapter. No, you know? it's not. I, I did notice that, but I, I also really loved that chapter. It felt, it felt yeah. like exactly as long as it needed to be. It's a little bit on the shorter side compared yeah. to some of your other chapters. Um, and there are just a few moments in your conversation with the, the expert that you were talking with that aren't humor, but are a little bit more casual. And it, it, it sort of was like this interesting yeah. um, study of the kinds of work that these people do yes. means that they have to sort of disconnect. And, yes. and you talk a little bit about this in your in your book. Did you find that by writing about cadavers that your sort of connection to either death or the, the dead people was different? Um, I, it, it changed over the course of the book. And I think in a way that's kind of inevitable mm -hmm. when you are working with cadavers, particularly the bodies of, of, an, of anonymous or people who are anonymous to you anyway. Um, my, the first, the first experience I had was at that uh, college of mortuary science. And I was watching the students who were learning, uh, embalming, uh, how to embalm somebody who's had a autopsy, which is tricky. It's not, I mean, it's no longer a closed system, the vas mm. the vasculature, I mean. Um, but that, but I happened to glance at the donor card and, you know, which gave some of his personal details. And suddenly, you know, he, this, this was like a, a person with a family and a history and a past. And it was very kind of emotional. Um, and I remember thinking, you know, was this, is this a good idea to do this book, you know, and also just the visuals because he'd had an autopsy. It was sort of this hole, this sort of like cavity, you know, kind of popped into my head a lot for the next few days. And I was like, this might, this might've been a bad idea, but um, very quickly you, you become accustomed to, um, to being around um, dead bodies. And I, I think, you know, that's very much true for the people who work with them. And even for students, uh, anatomy students, they have a lot of anxiety and trepidation about going into the anatomy lab. But by the end of the second day, you know, they're eating a sandwich and <laughs> sitting in the lab. It's not. So I think people underestimate their ability to, to, to cope with that. But I don't, I didn't, you know, I don't know that I have a different, I, I guess I have more appreciation and, mm. and respect for people who make that decision because a lot of people just go, oh, I don't know, that's, that's creepy. I don't want to do it. But it's so, it's such a generous thing to do, particularly organ and tissue donation. It's so, it's, it's, and it's such an easy thing to do when you're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you nothing to it. Yeah. You know, you're, uh, you don't even have to think about it. It's just happening. So, um, yeah. Um, so not a not profoundly different, yeah. We've got a couple of really great questions from our audience. We have two that are related, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of pitch them both at the same time. This one from John that reads: Do you have any updated information about Promessa, which you mention in the sort of like cremation and alternate yeah. um, uh, ideas for how to sort of like de you know decompose yeah. your body? And then another question um, from Kathy that reads. Has Mary Roach uh, studied the composting of bodies? Yeah. First heard about it in Seattle. So um, can yes. you talk about this a little bit in your epilogue? Sure, sure yes. Um, um, Promessa, I believe, is still in existence. Suzanne, sadly, uh, passed away. Uh, I forget. It's in the epilogue, I think, the year that she passed away. Um, and, and, and sadly for her, wasn't composted because the the, the system she, the system she was envisioning was quite complex she had a mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a deep freeze and then a breaking down and then a freeze drying so it was a you know technologically um, complex and expensive to set up and get going uh, so and, and there were a number of other uh, hurdles that I, I wasn't privy to kind of mm -hmm. personal uh, company-wide uh issues. I, I, mm -hmm. and I, I don't, I don't know exactly what those are, but that stood in the way of Promessa really getting up to speed. I haven't checked in with her since I wrote uh, with Promessa since I wrote the epilogue, but, um, there's been a lot going on, uh, Washington, Oregon, several other States have, have passed legislature making it uh, feasible to do, um, composting, which I don't, they have a technical term, something or other reduction <laughs> anyway yeah it's, not, mm -hmm. it's composting um and a, a quite elaborate system i think it's called recompose is the the upper is the operation in yep. um in the pacific northwest 
and I think they're franchising it to other states. And it's a beautiful facility. And the and it's um rather than you know Suzanne had sort of a shaking, I think that was going to break the body down because of course you want small pieces for comp. I mean, if anybody's done composting, you know you you don't put a whole side of beef in there. Mm -hmm, <laughs> well, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you want it broke, broken down. So there's more surface area, more, it's more exposed to oxygen and bacteria and it happens more quickly and you don't have rotting. So, um, so that process is done. You know, I think the body is put in with, with some materials like hay and I mean, there, it's not just a body. There's things that are added and then it's, it turns, it's sort of like a tumbler, mm -hmm. not, not like a dryer. It's not, but it's, it's turning periodically as my understanding. Mm -hmm. I have not visited there. Um, but it's a beautiful, uh, the, the facility, it, you know, has a mortuary aspect. It's a, kind of like a beautiful grounds and a, not a chapel, but it's a, it's a, you know, a meditative space. Uh, it, it, my only issue is not really an issue, but it's very expensive. And I kind of had imagined composting and green burial as well, which is just a shroud burial. I kind of imagined those as being um, less expensive than the traditional, very expensive coffin embalming funeral home option. Uh, so they're a little, they're a little surprisingly expensive, but anyway, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I think it's, I'm not surprised that it, that it has had um, the success that it's having because I would hear from people after the book came out, uh, people wanting to know uh, is Permessa up and running and can I do this? How do I do this? It really appeals to people to the idea to be taken up by a plant. Uh, and and to kind of give back to the earth, the, you know, which was really Suzanne's vision. She wasn't interested in mortuary science or even death. She was about in the environment and giving back and composting. And for her, it was a natural offshoot of that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are really interested in this topic too. We actually re um, interviewed the CEO and founder of Recompose a few oh, months yeah. ago. So. Um, so yeah, so I just posted a link to that in the chat in case anyone wants to listen to that interview. But it is, um, it's a really interesting process. And I think a lot of people who are looking for options are just like seeing a lot of promise in that. I think you're yeah. right though, maybe hoping for those costs to go down because yeah, you know, the hopeful and process I think would be for, for some of these things to be a little bit more affordable for anybody. Yeah, yeah. But it's nice, it, it does feel, um, you know, it was time for there to be an update in terms of options when people die, you know, the whole embalming coffin funeral home, I mean, it's fine. This it, it's an option, but it felt like there want there wanted to be another, particularly with an, env the environmental element of it was I think appealing and, and it was time for that. Yeah. Um, we've got some great questions from the audience. I'm going to go to another one from jazz. It reads, I would love to know what the process was like writing your first book and getting it published given its unique subject matter. We talked a little <laughs> bit about this, but what was it like yeah. trying to convince people that this was a good idea? Yeah. Um, well, the, the process of, um, it, it was surprisingly easy to, to sell this book. Uh, um, and my agent did a good job of that. I, you know, like I said before, I was of the opinion that this was a terrible idea with a limited <laughs> market. Uh, and um, it turned out that wasn't the case that one thing that I mean, a number of things helped this strange book find its way mm. into to press. Um, one was that around that time, Six Feet Under was very popular. And so was CSI. So you turn on the television, back when that's what you did, <laughs> turn on the television. <laughs> there would be bodies on slabs and there would be people talking about these things. And so the taboo kind of had eroded a little bit. Um, and so the timing was good in that sense, I think. Um, and I, nonetheless, I mean, I sold them. Also, my editor had just come off the success of the, this book called The Undertaking by the poet and undertaker Thomas Lynch, which was a, a success, very successful book. I mean, he's a lyrical, beautiful writer, and he's also a mortician and wrote this um, lovely book. And, and so she was thinking, oh, yeah, this death thing seems to, <laughs> seems to work. Let's take a chance on Mary Roach. So, um, so it wasn't particularly hard to sell it, um, but the, the writing of it for me, because when you, when, you, when you get a book contract, you're sort of turned loose for a couple of years, like, okay, see you in a couple of years, do something fantastic. And I, yeah, I didn't know, I, I was like this, 
I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't know, you know, the tone. I just went ahead with the tone that is me. Uh, but it felt sometimes like, is this going to be disrespectful, offensive? Is it, is it too much? And I thought, oh, well, I'm not worried in that my editor will come in and she'll strip out anything that's over the top. But she really didn't take stuff out. So that's, I think we just sort of crossed our fingers and put it out there with no real idea who it was going to appeal to, what the demographic would be. Um, but But publishing a first book is both incredibly liberating because you just go wherever you want to go. You follow, every, go down every rabbit hole you want to, but at the same time, terrifying because you don't know who you're writing for. You don't know who your audience is. You don't know if you're doing a good job. You don't know how to organize it. Um, so there's a lot of, I, a lot of times where I would just wake up in the middle of the night going, I am so screwed. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what the heck I'm doing. So that was kind of what it was like uh, to write that book. Yeah, it sounds like a wild ride. And did you find that that process got a little easier as you went along? Or has it just been a different experience each time writing about like a, yeah. a sciencey topic for people who either need to see a different perspective or maybe don't think very much about the topic? Um, it's it's easier. It's definitely easier. Um, one thing that's easier is now that um, n now that more people are familiar with me, if you happen to, you know, you approach, because you're off, you spend a lot of time approaching researchers, just cold emailing them. Oh, yeah. hello. I'm Mary Roach. Blah, blah. So when somebody goes, oh, I'm familiar with your work, that's just, it's so much easier. Because, like, okay, mm -hmm. you know what I do, you know what I'm looking for. It's a, so, it's an easier conversation. And it's, uh, so that's gotten easier. And I still spend the first six months just kind of flailing, you know, kind of not knowing what the book is really about and what's going to, go in it. Um, there's usually something that I go and report and end up leaving out. Uh, so, so I, you know, I can't say I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's never a streamlined process was definitely gotten easier. Yeah. Speaking of, so let's, we'll stay on sort of writing process and style for a little bit. Um, in your book, you, in Steph, you described Thomas Edison as a loopy individual, which I was just, <laughs> I like, don't remember <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, I never thought of him that way. But you, you know, you talk about some of his sort of out there ideas. And in in addition to like, yeah. being an incredible creative and, you know, yeah. science ingenuity, you, you give him a pat on the back as well. But in your time interviewing experts about science of death, yeah. digestive system, <laughs> war, sex, ghosts, animal lawbreakers, there's just so many topics. Has your way of writing about those people, the people who might be on the fringes, has that yeah. changed over the years? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I try to, I'm much more aware of um, wanting them to be happy with how they're described. I still feel bad about, there's a guy in Spook, my second book, and I described him as having sloping shoulders. And I'm like, why did I say that? That's not very nice. I mean, I don't, I mean, it's true. He had very <laughs> sloping shoulders, but now I try, I really go out of my way to um, emphasize the, and I'm talking in terms of physical looks. I mean, I always like to describe a, a person as well as the setting, just so the reader has, can visualize what they're reading. So I've, I've gone so far that uh, with Grunt, I think I described a lot of, um, the, there were a, a fair number of military men and some special operations guys. Uh, and I, I described them as I mean, they're all, they're really fit and they're handsome. And I, <laughs> so there's, I got this, there was this reviewer for the Washington Post who accused me of having crushes on all these men in, in the military. And I'm like, I'm 60 plus years old. I was like, no, <laughs> that's not what's going on. I'm, I'm just trying to be positive in my descriptions. But, um, <laughs> and I, I just, yeah, I've gotten more careful about that. You know, I think, I think writing 20 years ago is more of a more of a process from the id, and the, mm -hmm. and now the super ego is. You know, I'm I'm definitely edit trying to edit myself and think a little bit about, um, you know, when I write something, who might be reading this. You know, instead mm -hmm. of just picturing sort of like, you know, in being John Malkovich, where in the restaurant everybody is John Malkovich. You mm -hmm. know, my mm -hmm. my original approach was just like writing for a bunch of merry roaches, mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Yeah. And I think, you know, now I, I try, you know, I try to keep in mind that people are coming from other perspectives and I don't know, just have more of a sensitivity. Like yesterday, just yesterday, I was um, 
writing up a conversation I had with a researcher from Tennessee whose name is Jim Crow. <laughs> I'm like, Mary, leave it alone. Yeah, Just leave it alone. Everyone will get there together and <laughs> yeah. we can talk about the research. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it's so interesting in, in stiff. What I feel like happens is you're laying out all of these different options for people. Here are the, the ways that we understand ourselves and our lives better because of the research that cadaver science allows us to do. And at the end of the book, I, I wouldn't say you make an about face, but you do mention to people like there was a person you spoke with who said, and you agreed with them, at the end of the day, the, the people who have to deal with this decision that you make are your family. Like they, they have to carry out your last yeah. wishes. And so you do have to consider them in that process, talk to them, see what makes sense for their mm -hmm. sensibilities, yeah. their spiritual beliefs, their you know belief in science. And so yeah. um, do, do you find that anyone sort of pushes back on that idea when you mention it to them? Or are people sort of, as they read the book, they're like coming to the same conclusion as you? Um, pushing back on the idea of donating at all? Or well, just like, no, just do what you want. Don't, you don't have to consider your oh, family oh, or like. Oh, like well, um, it's interesting in, in more recent research for a different project, um, I was talking to people, uh, someone in the realm of not organ donation, but tissue donation. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because the, if you uh, donate, if you're an organ donor and you say, this is what I want done, that's what happens even if your family doesn't feel comfortable with it. You made mm. the donation and that's that's awkward. There's like somebody was calling up going, I'm going to call the police. I'm going to call the police. I don't want you doing this to my loved one. And and that's, I mean, they, yeah. So, and I don't know if that's different state by state or what the, mm -hmm. um, but the place that I was, which was Pennsylvania, they're like, this is a decision that the person made and legally that's what happened. Tissue mm -hmm. donation is a little different. There's a timing the, issue there. That's different, right? Well, there's a timing issue with organs as well. Um, yeah. But but with tissue donation, if the per, uh, there's a long list of questions that have that that the um, the family member has to answer in order for the person to be cleared to donate, so that mm. there's not infectious diseases or you know various things that would put the recipient at risk. And in that case, if the person just doesn't answer, says I'm not I'm not talking to you. That's it. There's like the 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 donation won't be made, but the tissues won't be procured. So, yeah. um, so people have, I mean, I, I do feel like it, it's for, I, that's why I emphasize in the book, it, if it's something you want to do, it's so important to let your family know, because it, if someone's not expecting it and all of a sudden, you know, you get this call, like we're coming for your, <laughs> we're coming for your dad. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a tissue yeah. and organ donor. They'd be like, you're what, you know, yeah. um, it's just important to, um, for people to feel good with, the decision. Yeah. On the other side, we have this question from Wendy who asked, like, I don't know if you've addressed Gila controversy. You don't talk about this too much in the book, no. but um, the the idea of consent. And so yeah. like, do you have a perspective or as you were reading or writing this book, yeah. was there a, a thing you wanted to make clear about the whole, like the being consent, used without yeah. your consent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, how, that's, um, that's really been, especially in the past year or so, um, the stuff going on at the Mütter Museum, which has um, specimens mm -hmm. that have unusual medical afflictions, you know, either to the skeleton or preserved pieces of the body. And some of those people did not give consent. I mean, they were, I mean, it was very much speaking of a product of their times. That's just, oopsie, that was just um, not something that people considered so um it's changed so much now there's such such um very specific consent particularly like when i was working on grunt um they were doing a um a uh cadaver trial they're trying to develop a crash test dummy specifically for um underbody blast like a, a personnel carrier that drives over an mm -hmm. ied and some of them mm -hmm. are huge the force is coming up from below so the existing crash test dummies aren't helpful so they mm -hmm. were designing a new one and to do that to have an accurate sense of what happens to the body and is this being protective enough 
um, they had to use cadavers and and the the level of consent, the layers of consent, very specific consent that are in place, that's completely 180 degrees different than it was, say, in the 1800s, where there was this sort of presumed, I can do what I want with whoever I want. So that has um, been very much been in the news lately. Um, I, I, don't, I'm, I didn't get into it in the book because honestly, it was not really being covered. And I hadn't, you know, they, I do talk about um, uh, the early days of body snatching, which was digging up bodies from uh, recently buried bodies. And, and that was what anatomy labs in the UK and also here, well, that's what they some often ended up using because there was no willed body program. There was mm -hmm. no, there's no way to do it properly. So in order to learn anatomy, that's what they resorted to. And, and it's a, it's tough because it's important for a student who's going to be a medical professional to understand what's in there. And I understand why it was done, but the way it was done, um, it was pretty, pretty ugly. Uh, so, yeah. um, so there is a whole chapter on that, on body snatching and, and, um, the progression of of uh, consent and and the the way that there's now there are um, legal options for people to do it, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing how times have changed. And I still run across, you know, you, you'd be reading a medical journal from the 1800s, and it'll be like, yeah, we tried this surgery, and then we went over to the the Negro unit or something. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, uh huh, because that's where all your guinea pigs were, and and that's what they were to you more than patients. And I, you know, I still I run across that all the time, and um, in medical journals from the 1800s and early 1900s as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder if you think that part of what your book was sort of working against were these ex like, like really far reaching and, and long lasting stigmas about these like processes that we don't do anymore because we have willed body programs and these other in incentives to, yeah. sort of not monetary incentives, but usually like moral incentives yeah. to donate your bodies. Do you find that, that, were you thinking at all about that? Like working against those preconceived notions of like, well, we're, we're still body snatching. It's like, no, we're, we're not like, I promise we're yes. not. Um, yes. There's, you, find that you were writing in that sort of perspective as well. Yeah. Yes. All, uh, in particular with um, organ donation, there's a mm -hmm. persisting, I don't, I don't know, if it's an urban myth, but myth or belief that um, if you're an organ donor, that's whoever on the emergency medical staff or in the ER or the OR, they're go they're more likely to just let you die so they can get your organs, which just isn't true, and it's surprisingly persistent that myth. Um, and and so yeah, that was definitely something. I was working against and, and I do, you know, I, I try to, I just try to encourage people wherever I can to, uh, to sign up for it, you know, if not tissue, if, you know, tissue donation, if you're not comfortable with that, but organs, I mean, that's just surgery. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to come and open as though you were having surgery, you're, you're going to, mm -hmm. they're going to open you up and they're going to take out the organs and then they're going to stitch you back up. It's not, it's no more gruesome than a surgery that's done to, you know, repair a hernia or fix your liver. <laughs> so, I try to kind of make people see that and, and demystify it. it. It's a it's a book that's really about demystifying because I think mm. people are wary of the unknown. They're like, I don't know what's going if I donate my body to science, w what's going to be done? Or or if I'm a tissue donor, what does that look like? An organ donor, what will that be like uh, f for me as a dead person? And and even though you're dead and you're not going to see it and you're not going to be squeamish or embarrassed or you're you're de you're dead you're dead, but it's it's you as a living person that makes the choice and yeah. so for for me to just make it just like straightforward this is how it goes and this is what it achieves and this is why you might want to consider it that that's definitely what the book's about yeah we had a question sent in via audio from one of our book club members i'm going to play it here for you now this is lisa calling from oakland california mary how, if, if at all, did your research for STIF affect your own ideas about death and what you plan for your own cadaver? Have you continued oh. to evolve your ideas and your plans as you have lived another 25 years? Thanks. <laughs> Thank this you. This is Lisa calling. There we go. 
Um, yeah. So how have your ideas evolved in the last few years since you've written the book? Um, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but um, I am still inclined to donate because I feel like I wrote this book. I really, it'd be, it'd be shameful if I didn't. And I have, I still have the papers, <laughs> but I haven't signed them yet. Partly because there's part of me really still likes the, the tradition of, I mean, not necessarily the process of cremation and the mm -hmm. pollution that it causes, but the, you know, the, the, the final disposition of cremains uh, in, in a, in a place that the sort of the ceremony of that, and that, you know, why, I don't know why that's a sticking point for me. And mm -hmm. I do think that I'm, I am going to donate. And it's still, it's one of those these things I've like, well, you know, what makes me think I've got an infinite amount of time to make that decision? I really ought to just send the papers in. I have them for God's sakes. <laughs> um, but anyway. You, when you, when you tell people that, do you find that they're surprised that that's the, that's where you are in the process right now? Do you think that they anticipate that you've you've made your plan or well i never tell people because i'm too embarrassed i don't think there's anything i i will do my best to absolve you of that i don't think there's anything to be embarrassed about i think everyone does the process in the way that makes sense for them um in yeah. fact one of our community members mentioned you know they, they posted a comment that was encouraging people to try their best to get over their squeamishness about some of these ideas and I posted the quote about, you know, the um, the the um, uh, anatomy professor, I think it was, who mentioned like, this is a, a decision like you as a family member that you have to do what makes you feel good. You have to live with yeah. it. Like someone does have to live with the decision. And so um, and you have to live with while you are alive, your thoughts and feelings and ideas about some of these these processes. And um, yeah. you know. I mean, I'm definitely an organ tissue donor. It just the the um, the whole What's anatomy that? lab scene I have to. But, you know, I wrote this and I reread this this morning. I wrote this letter that I want to go in my file. And I do. Uh, I think what's really pushing me towards getting and you know what I need to just it's partly I just don't ever get around to thinking about it um, but I do like the image of whoever that medical student those medical students are who get me reading mm -hmm. that letter uh, I, I like that I like that idea of um, I just like picturing that scene happening after I'm gone yeah you you talk a little bit about those memorial services that anatomy departments do after a semester or after a year of working in um, these anatomy labs. Um, and you, in your epilogue, mentioned that it's much more widespread. Um, yes. Does that kind of give you hope for the continued evolution of our ideas around cadaver and cadaver research? Yeah, I think, and I absolutely loved, there's that one school where there's a, um, a brunch, I think it was, or a lunch where mm -hmm. the medical students sit down with the family members of the person who they're about to dissect. Yeah. And that's incredible because it's a, it's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one specific um, interaction and an ability to thank the family. And, 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 and they were very nervous about that and how, how's this going to go down, but it's been really popular. And uh, I hope that other schools do that as well. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's also just really good for the medical students too. It's an it's just an interesting um, perspective that they wouldn't necessarily have, and it and it, and it also uh, fosters a certain amount of respect because now it's not an anonymous person really. It, they they have a sense of who this person was and their what their life was like, and yeah, I think that's healthy. So um, I I love that, and and the 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 event that I went to was incredibly moving. I mean, there, everyone was choked up. It was the, the things that the students had written or performed. Some of them performed songs. It was mm -hmm. really moving. And I walked, I remembered specifically crossing the street to go back to my car thinking, I am definitely going to donate. And then, of course, never signed the papers. Just because you haven't signed the papers doesn't mean it's not a reality. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, we have time for just one more question. Um, I, I wonder if people, you imagine someone picks up this book and they're sort of 50-50. They're like, you know, I don't know if this is the right book for me. Or someone recommends it and they, you know, grab it from the library and, and they're unsure if they're going to take it out. 
Is there something you wish you could say to that person in a sentence or two about um, what they hope they get out of reading your book? Um, I think I, I, I think I just would hope that, that I'm just read 10 pages because it's it's a very hard book to describe and it, and I mm -hmm. completely understand why someone might say this book is not for me you know I, I either they're squeamish or they think that it's going to be really gross and rude or they think it's going to be too technical or um and I I just I, you know I'd like them to you know, just just give it a try it's because it's it's none of those things I don't think it's it's weirdly enough a, fu a fun read that's, I guess, the hardest thing to get people to realize when they see the cover. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but just um, you know, it 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 has its profundities, but it's not a heavy death book. You know, it's uh, um, it it's it's that it it can be an enjoyable death. It can be an enjoyable read. <laughs> Yeah, I love what you say in the introduction is that like this book isn't really about dying. It's about death. And that's, they're actually really different things. Yes. And so um, I hope that yeah. people will read more than 10 pages, but at least we'll give it the 10 <laughs> page for sure. Because I, I think it's a lovely book. And, and Mary, thank you so much for, for writing it, for being down to chat with our community today. And um, we're excited for what comes next. Well, thank you so much, Diana. It was really fun. I haven't talked about Stiff that much uh, in a, in a while, and so it was it was it was a treat for me. And the questions were great, yours as well as the readers. I mean, and uh, or the viewers, the book club members. So um, I'm really grateful. And uh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. If you want to find out more about the Science Friday Book Club, sciencefriday.com is the place to do it. If you're even more invested in that, sciencefriday.com slash book club is the place to find everything. We've got more stuff going on for Stiff. We have a community meeting that is just the people who are part of our community who actually just talk about the book. So you can find out more on our website and I hope you will. Um, Mary, thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. All right, take care. Thanks, bye everyone. Bye.